that shit. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face behind my back and talk trash. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and on today's episode, I have my very special guest, Mr. Brian Ebersol, current UFC welterweight contender. Brian, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, good. Just got done training and uh, looking forward to getting on the air with you. Excellent. So, got done training. Uh, I'm assuming that you mean for your upcoming fight against uh, Alan Jabon. Yeah, I got a June 6th fight. So, uh, I'm just under three months out and uh, trying to get some body fat to fall off me. And, and then I can start worrying about a game plan. But, yeah, the body fat first. How much time do you like to try to get before you get a fight? Um, we always usually get about three months, um, and the UFC has been really, really good to me. I pretty much pick my month, and they start to work down what shows are going to be that month and uh, email me back. And um, not, I don't really get to choose an opponent, but they've been really good to me letting me choose like if there's fights on other sides of the world. So, for example, the one time there was a fight in New Jersey and one in Brazil. And I was able to say I'd rather fight in New Jersey. They put me on the New Jersey show. You know, I, I don't really get to choose opponents. I've never had more than one opponent offered to me, you know, for a fight. It's always this is the guy, that's the date, that's the date and event you said you wanted to fight on. So I don't really argue after that and go, oh, well, yeah. you know, could I, could I get an ultimate fighter kid so I can get a, an easy win? You know what I mean? So, yeah, they've been good to me as far as letting me make my own calendar uh, yeah. per se. Well, I mean, so when I'm healthy, the... when I'm healthy, I let them know, and and you know, I, I give about a five month notice, okay. four and a half months notice, and then I know that I start kind of jogging around and shadow boxing and doing my thing a little bit harder, and um, about three months out, I usually get that email that says, "All right, here you go." Yeah, well, looking at your uh, you know your extensive record, you've had uh, this is going to be your seventieth fight coming up. I think you've pretty much deserved the right to at least pick where your fights take place. <laughs> Perhaps that's yeah, uh because I mean you've certainly these. proven that you'll take a fight anywhere in the world. I mean you've fought everywhere. Yeah, I mean I've I've covered a few continents. Um, I haven't fought in Brazil, and that's kind of one of those ones where, you know, everyone says, "Oh, I'd love to fight down in Brazil." I'm at the stage where the travel and all that stuff at this point go, and then trying to come back home and all that. It's almost too much hassle. I think if I ever see Brazil, it's going to be like a training trip uh, when I'm done competing, just to go down and see the place and travel to some gyms and, you know, just explore. You know, I, I don't train in a gi very often, so yeah. I, I've told myself I'll try to get my black belt when I'm done um, with the martial arts as a competitor. Okay. So, again, that, that Brazil trip might be something where I go spend a month and train in a gi every day. and. Ah oh, well, listen. I mean, that's Excellent. another that's another mecca. I think you I think you owe it to yourself to do it just to cross that off the bucket list. I mean, I, me as a fan, I just want to go see a UFC event in Brazil. Uh, they, those are just off the chain, you know. I mean, it, the ruckus that those guys. I just love to see and experience that feel of going to a a big fight. You know, they were saying that they would have loved to have done Chris Weidman against Vitor there in a soccer stadium, and I mean, I can't even imagine the, just the the chaos. That would that would be an event of that magnitude in a soccer stadium in Brazil. Yeah, I'd probably actually rather go as a spectator, just enjoy myself and enjoy the food and the drinks and and the atmosphere, as opposed to trying to sequester myself and stay sane in a hotel, and make weight, and yeah, and uh, and that whole mess. So yeah, that that might actually be the nicer side of the ball, is to go as a spectator. Yeah, let me just make a quick adjustment on my mic here. All right. That's going to be a bit, that's going to be a whole lot nicer sounding. Um, okay, so back to your training. Um, we'll, we'll talk about Juban in a bit, but uh, what's, what's your game plan? How are you, how, you, you fly and train all over the place, the States, Australia, Thailand. What's, uh, what's on the menu for this fight? I have had the absolute craziest time trying to plan this fight camp. Um, it seemed like every... For about three weeks straight, every four days, a new variable got thrown into the mix and things were changing. So um, at, at one point, my original plan uh, and my best plan was to come to Australia, let my wife see her family, and uh, I can travel here and, and train with some of the best guys in the country and some of the better coaches that I've, I've made you know, inroads with over the years 
of living here. So I was going to spend a good six weeks in Australia, and then I was going to go spend seven or eight weeks in Thailand and finish uh, with my team at Tiger Muay Thai and then go over to the U.S. just for fight week. A lot of times I go to the U.S. early and get used to the time zone. Um, I actually had hoped to fight in the Philippines in Manila in May. Yeah. So that was kind of the original event. plan. Finish training in Thailand. Yeah, finish training in Thailand and then go fight in Manila. Hop, skip, that way I don't change time zone. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to change time zone. So is Manila, is Manila the same time zone as here? Is it is the same as in Phuket? Uh, well, Maybe it's two hours. Off, yeah, exactly. terrible. Okay. Yeah, it's a short flight. It's not the other side of the world. And I was going to be able to go fight without all the pressure of hosting a bunch of people. You know, like when I go home. <laughs> yeah, it's I, the... On the phone and all that, you know what I mean? I was able, I was gonna be able to fight, and then as soon as I got to the U.S. and landed, I could have just holiday, family, the whole thing, as opposed to doing that the week before the fight, the month before the fight, getting caught back up into that mindset. So um, I was really looking forward to that plan. Come to find out, the day that Joe Silva sent me the email that said, "Yep, here's your opponent for that May 13th show or 15th show, if you want it." My wife had a meeting with the U.S. government for her green card. She's Australian, and we're trying to move to the U.S., and she wants work rights, obviously. So we okay. got this big process to go through, 27 applications and I-35s and I-452 yeah. later. I have a good friend who's going through that crap yeah. in, uh, in Canada right now. Same thing. Married a German girl, and he, he's just like, dude, it's just chaos to, to, to get these permits and all this immigration stuff. It's just a nightmare. So I'm like... <laughs> I've, I've been, it's funny and that it's, you bring that up because I'm dealing with that with a buddy right now too. We're two college educated people and we're having a tough time with these forms. And no oh, one really oh. wants to give you much advice. They just tell you to fill out the form that you think you should fill out and then they'll give you a decision. They don't really advise you or show you the best way. So there's like these magical combinations of forms that you can fill out at different times that probably are more efficient. So we've probably yep. found a less efficient route um, doing what we've done. But she had to go up and do the biometrics it, up in the town I was born in, which is funny enough. Of all the places for my wife to go for a, a green card uh, uh, interview, it's, yeah. it's the place I was born, some small town up in Indiana. Okay. So we I'm go sorry. up there, and this, this lady is so frustrated after she hears our story um, about how – the 800 number and the website uh, have given us some misinformation and and we've been a little bit led astray. Long story short, we were traveling on the Tuesday. This is a Thursday, so we only had a couple days before we left the country. They told her she couldn't leave the country because she would abandon her application. It's a $2,000 application process. Yeah, but she can't so leave the country. You know. Yeah, so then we had to prove that her... Uh, family member she had a family member that's very ill so we had to pull up those emails and show that and have to do this almost the sob story and say she's going to see her family member you know like yeah, this yeah. might be this might be go time and you know i'm gonna go see her before yeah. she passes away kind would of it thing. kill you guys to show uh to lend a sympathetic ear <laughs> right yeah like. well five hundred dollars five hundred dollars an application and two days of running around to chicago um, got us a 45 day, what they called a parole. So my skilled, yeah, a little, a little exit window. Educated, yeah. My skilled labor, college educated wife trying to move to America with me has been put on parole by the American government <laughs> to go see her family Wow, for 45 days. Well, that barely covered the time we wanted to be away for Australia, yep. let alone us going to Thailand and so I told Joe Silva I couldn't take that fight. I'm going to need some extra time. Um, let me fight a couple weeks later and preferably in the U.S. So yeah. I got booked for June 6th uh, versus Alan Joban in New Orleans. And now the plan is I'm going to stay an extra two weeks back here in Australia after she leaves. Um, so bypassing going to Thailand, I'm going to stay in Australia with, with my striking coach uh, for as long as I can. And then when I get to the U.S., I'm going to travel. I'll probably train in Chicago, Vegas, and, and there's a possibility of going down with Rafael Lovato Jr. in Oklahoma City for a little while and then just making my way into, uh, into fight week in New Orleans just, uh, just in time. So 
Yeah, it's going to be a very traveled camp, and, and I guess that fits uh, the history I've, I've written for myself, which is seek out good martial artists, and when you find people you like, stick around and learn what you can. Now, I mean, that's interesting because, yeah, I mean, you've, you've fought everywhere and in every promotion, and here you've just described a, a scenario where you're basically going to move around between four or five different camps. It, it almost seems like, I mean, a lot of guys tend to just settle down in one place and train in one place. What, what is it you like to feed on? I mean, like you said, you like to find people that you want to keep training with, but you also seem to continuously be seeking out new partners. Is that accurate? Um, yeah, here's the thing. Like I'm, I'm sitting here in Melbourne now and, and my coach, he's an American guy, but he's lived here for like 20 some years and I've known him since oh, 2007, probably 2008 okay. when I first came out and, and did a seminar at his gym and we, we developed a relationship ongoing past that. He's got guys now that weren't training with him when I met him that are now like giving me a hard time on the mat. And part of it is the education that I help bring with the wrestling that yeah. he's implemented into the culture of his gym. But he's got like some 20 year old guys that are grabbing me and don't go telling anyone, but <laughs> there, there's a kid or two here that can almost guillotine. Yeah. They learn yeah. quickly. Don't they, when they're young now? It's uh it's something else. I mean, well, I mean, you know, that's, it, that, that's one of the, the, the things we can talk about too is you know you get these you get these John Joneses you get these guys who are, are training everything from the get-go guys like Rory McDonald I mean you know you uh, you know I did a little did a little bit of my research on you before this interview and uh, actually a little known fact I mean you started with wrestling in kindergarten and your grandfather had a youth wrestling club is that correct yeah my my grandfather saw a need in our town because Freshmen, sophomore, juniors in high school were just getting pummeled at our school okay. because there were kids that were wrestling in other towns in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way through middle school. By the time they got to high school, they were pretty competent. So it wasn't an athletic contest by then. We had athletes. They had skilled, you know, skilled people. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't until our guys were like our, you know, seniors that they had any chance of of coming and winning because it took them that two, three, four years of, of getting competent at what they were trying to do and mixing that with their athleticism as well. Um, so he started a kids program and, and helped that get going. And, um, yeah, multiple years later, I was obviously born and, and able to follow, uh, I guess that, that opportunity, that pathway that he, he kind of laid down. Um, you know, he was a successful professional, 10 kids, pretty busy guy i mean he didn't coach he didn't coach this team for 50 years or anything okay um but he's definitely you know there at the outset as a co-founder and and got the thing um yeah pretty neat little history there as far as uh some some family involvement yeah and so i mean that leads into what we were talking about before you know you get these all-arounders these guys that are that are training all the all the specific disciplines simultaneously basically training mma you come from a wrestling background, and now you know you're you're training with guys 20 years old, and 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 you're like, what the hell? How how am I, how am I getting caught? I mean, that must just, for somebody as, such as yourself, who's had you know nearly 70 fights, and you're seeing how these guys evolve. Do you just see these guys improve exponentially? I mean, it must be frightening to see that that growth and that that rapid learning, that accelerated learning process. I think what it is 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 most sports obviously have their their skill sets and then you see a lot of times depending on body type you see certain strategies kind of fall along these lines like if you go watch a wrestling meet at the high school level or the college level you'll see the guys at different weight classes wrestle different like just the pattern of the match yeah is different you know heavyweights wrestle different than guys at 125 pounds they fight different than guys at 125 pounds um, two heavyweights hit the mat, they're stuck to the mat. Yeah. When a heavyweight can pop back up, you know, like Cain Velasquez can do, it's special. It's not special at 125 for your hips to hit the floor and for you to be standing up a split second later because yeah. everybody at 125 can do that. Yeah, but you get, know, get, like get Roy Nelson to do that. Yeah, exactly. Get Roy Mark Hunt to do it. that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's different. Well, I, what I think is like guys like John Jones that had a wrestling skill set 
going into his teenage years, but able to watch mixed martial arts, in the back part of his brain, it didn't have to be at the forefront. It didn't have to be anything he tried to consciously do. But I guarantee you, him looking at fighting all the time on the mixed martial arts stage led him to process, even subconsciously, his own ability to do what he saw other people doing. And, yeah. and I mean by Mark, uh, Mark Coleman had a wrestling skill set, took it to MMA. Yep. John Jones knew as much as Mark Coleman did by the time Mark Coleman was going out and John Jones was coming in. John Jones was already as aware mentally of the game, the possibilities, the dangers, and the benefits of his skill set because he'd seen other wrestlers go and do all this and the problems that they were faced with, the advantages they had, and the openings that, that were there for them to go and be successful and, and, and win these fights. So, Yeah, it's, it's the just difference between having to pioneer something and another one to watch what the pioneers have done and benefit from that accelerated learning curve and, and just skip to the front of the line. Yeah, I mean, you, you see like the first guys that built websites and how basic these websites were, but it was amazing at the time. And then Dude. you get just some young little kid that comes in yeah. and he's got – He's got Tetris going down the right side, and he's got widgets flicking over the left. He's got banner ads here. And, uh, I mean, you don't have to tell me about also, that. I am in the like, thick of that right now. Like, I am literally yeah. in the thick. I've just launched my first. And listen, I've been in software de development for 15 years. You know, I, I used to be the audio director for, uh, for NBA Live. I worked for eight years at EA Sports. I did six years at THQ working on um, the UFC Undisputed trilogy. So I know software development, but I know audio and software development. I've never made my own website, and I've always wanted to do it. I, people have always said, "Hey, man, you you know you love never." You know, they're always saying, "Never, never do what you do well for free." And I've often enjoyed yeah. debating and talking mixed martial arts um, and being a, kind of like a super fan and just putting my opinion out there and debating and bouncing ideas back and forth with people. So I, I finally came to. The realization that I got to try to do this and, and, and make it a business. So, you know, obviously your, your website is your, it's your, it's your hub for everything for my podcast, my YouTube channel, etc. But man, I'm so glad I started doing it now because with like WordPress, it's available to anybody to really whip together a site pretty quick that has some nifty little functionality. But trust me, even though it's easy to do that, now I want to kind of like kick it up a notch and have it optimized and have it, you know, make the user experience really tight. And I already feel the need that I got to bring some people in or a person in to, to check it out. And I mean, it's kind of like yeah. a fighter going through a camp where he's like, look, my wrestling's tight, my jujitsu's tight, but I got to work on my kickboxing. Let's bring in this dude and, you know bring that segment up a notch that you're a complete fighter etc and I, i'm i'm feeling that I, I like that comparison that you just made to to you know you just brought up out of nowhere out of you know the evolution of websites and how fast people can make slick ones now but it still takes an expertise yeah, the tools of becoming what's mainstream. basic now yeah what's basic now was was you know oh that's like it's just a given that's, you know that's calculus to some guy that started doing this back in the day yeah you know, what is that? How do you do that? You know, it's it's mind boggling. So yeah, you see the Rory McDonalds come in with with a really big picture understanding of the game, and he's not trying to wrestle to wrestle. He's trying to wrestle to win a fight. He's not trying to wrestle to beat a wrestler. You know, he's not going to go give up a certain uh, position because he knows there's a next one there. You know what I mean? It's it's more of a big full full circle as opposed to. I need to be on top all the time, all the time, all the time. He's yeah. happy to roll under if it, if it suits him. So let's get to Juban then. Um, is that how we pronounce his name? I don't, I don't know. I don't. I'm saying Juban. So much I don't. So much <laughs> I don't like about the kid already. Oh, I've got a great one for you. Did you know that there's a model website called the most beautiful most beautiful man .com, and they refer to Juban as, I quote, one of the foremost male models in Los Angeles. Hey, he's made a name for himself in a couple fields. <laughs> it's because I noticed you made a curious, uh, hilarious comment where uh, people asked you what you think of your opponent and you said that he's handsome. So, yeah, that's an understatement. Yeah, he's kind of the Brad Pitt of MMA. So what's the game plan to knock the knock the pretty off his face or what? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I want to hit him. I mean, I reckon if I hit him, everything else gets a little bit easier. Yeah. But the hard part is I've never went into a way in knowing I'm going to lose the way in. <laughs> and I'm I'm conceding the way in here. 
I'm like, this is your show. The ring girls aren't even going to look at me. This is going to be just a very demoralizing Friday. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all about the fight now. A lot of times I stress uh, about the weigh-in. Now the way and actually yeah. the pressure's off. All, all you got to do is hang your head. You just got to hang your head in shame and uh, lose your lose your weight like a like a man and let Juban yeah. uh, woo the ladies or the ring girls. It's great. I, I, who was I? Who was I looking at? Oh yeah. So when I was researching Travis Luter before interviewing him yesterday, there was a little video, and I don't know. I don't know if it was Ariane or one of the other ring girls. And when he when he failed to make weight against uh, Anderson Silva, you know they were filming the weigh-ins, and it's pretty funny because they had to bring up the towel. And, you know he totally. Oh, yeah. You know he had to gear down completely. You know drop trow, and uh, it was pretty funny because one of the ring girls you could see that just as he dropped his uh, his gaunch or whatever that she uh, she eyeballed his junk. So uh, as long as you make weight, I don't think you'll have to be subject to that. Uh, but I'm, I'm, maybe the Ringos are going to hope that Juban doesn't make weight to put him in that uh, <laughs> to make put him in that uh, that uh, interesting situation. Or maybe he won't make weight on purpose. Maybe he'll be just above just it to create almost, a little. It almost sucks that I I heard he's married, so that almost sucks. Like I I could have played around and sent girls up to his room or something <laughs> the night before the fight and tried to take his legs uh, away. And the fight's but in New Orleans. The fact I'm, that he's I'm, married might be that difficult. Yeah, you could probably find some uh, some rowdy paid to paid strippers who would uh, go mess up his night just before his fight. But yeah, we're in New Orleans. I mean, someone was just telling me the other day that it, like Lawrence Taylor was renowned for that back when Lawrence Taylor played in the NFL. So yeah, it kind of made me have a little bit of a giggle. And then I thought about it, and then I read that he was married, and I'm like, oh. But dude, that that might make it easier. I mean, come on, it's not hard to corrupt married men, right? <laughs> Oops, <laughs> you're married recently. I never said that. Exactly. Wall of shame. Yeah, walk of yeah. shame. Okay. Uh, back to the facts, though. He's 11-3 and three with eight vicious KOs. The guy knows how to knock dudes out, and he knows how to knock them out early. How does that, uh, how does that affect your training, your game plan? Um, well, I, I guess it just gives me openings to hit him back because I've never been knocked out, and I don't think this is the kid that's going to find my chin. How do you, I mean? How do you explain that? Sixty-nine fights, never knocked out. Have have you? Has it been close? Have you been knocked out in training? What, what, what did you just no. got? You just got a, a brick of cement in your skull. How how does that work? Sometimes I think so. I mean, I've been hit and I've just never felt disconnected. I've never had. Have you ever felt past rocked? A flash. Um, I've had a small flash, but I've never. I've never slowed down. Like, you know, you get nailed sometimes and you see guys fighting that are still there, but their neurons aren't firing and they're, they're in oh, yeah, slow yeah. motion. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, never felt that. Like, they're the hardest out. two times, the hardest two times I remember being hit are both at AKA when I was there in California. And one was Paul Bonatello with a straight right hand and I headbutted it. Like Brian Dennehy out of the Gladiator. I just headbutted it. Yeah, and for and anybody who doesn't hands, know, Buentello's a big heavyweight with a ton of knockout power. The headhunter. Yep, the headhunter. Yeah, says it all. Big man. I like Buntello. Big man. And I was hundred. I was one hundred ninety pounds. You know what I mean? He's big heavyweight. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're outweighed by eighty pounds. Yeah. I mean, so he, he was a type of guy who would. Head, he'd have to cut. Did he have to cut weight to make? Did he have to cut weight to make two sixty five Buntello? No, probably not. Right. Yeah. But he was a big boy. He is a big boy. Big guy. Yeah. But yeah, like I remember feeling like the tiniest little flash. But then I was, my eyes were open. I felt lucid and happy, and I finished the round. He shook his hand out. You know, thank God that he had good hand wraps on because yeah, yeah. you know, he cracked my nose pretty hard. Um, and then Mike Kyle, I remember, kicked me in the head, and I, I had my guard up. But he, I mean, it he hit me hard. My wrist about went through my temple, and Mike, I had the Mike nice Kyle's big flat. Brutal too, man. I mean, and that's another big dude. Yeah. It's like, you know, he's he's pretty much akin to Anthony Johnson. Yep, yeah. I was going to say, like, body, he's one of those scary 205ers who comes to kill dudes. Well, he was a heavyweight at the time. He was yep. 240. Yeah, yeah. He's a big man. You know, he still had his football body. So those are the two terms, times I've, I've been hit hard. I, I got hit pretty good today. No drama, you know what I mean? Yeah. Big boxing gloves on. Coach cracked me with one and just looked at him like, damn it. You know, it's the ones that you don't see that get you. And, and I think that's where I'm pretty good is I have a good enough awareness to know when I'm even when I'm out of position, I know where you could hit me from. 
It's you incredible, I mean? Brian. I mean, like, I think that's that's a, a, that's a remarkable story to be seventy fights, uh, sixty nine fights deep, and that's not even counting, you know, and, and that you literally haven't been rocked. I mean, that's that's crazy. I mean, I mean, we we, we were talking and we did a little bit of an outtake uh, before we started recording here, and uh, you know, we talked about guys like Anderson Silva with an IQ, but obviously you've got a gift for avoiding taking shots to the head. Yeah, I, it's just part of my strategy. Like again, I'm a wrestler. I'm not a boxer first. I, counted on punching to win me a fight um and and i've got to say that there's there's something about that being in the back of my head where i can win a fight without running through a brick wall and and i almost refuse to try to run through brick walls all the time yeah um yeah not the chris Lee strategy you know, yeah i can't i can't fight like that so this is I, interesting I and the, and the fact that you brought it up that you know you're you're never going or that you don't need to go to your strikes to necessarily win a fight what, what I like about you is um, you've got this wrestling background you're a, an incredible grappler and that seems to be the the core of your of your fight style and yet people really want to see you fight people tune into your fights there's always a lot of enthusiasm around a Brian Ebersol fight how do you explain that? Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that I think we see that there's tons of wrestlers and they evolve into wrestler boxers. And while they're grapplers and wrestlers, they don't they don't manage to generate the hype. I'll, I'll take somebody maybe like a Gray Maynard before he kind of got into his, his punching power. You know, people are like, oh, he's decision, decision, decision. Not a lot of hype. Clay Guida, who uh, you're close friends with, I believe, you know, it took him, uh, yep. you know, he, he had a uh, he has that ability to make super exciting fights without a ton of, of striking power. And it, it seems like you fall into that category of exciting grapplers, if I may say so. Thank you, thank you, I'll take it. Um, I think when I, I finally get to unleash some ground and pound, like it, it's, I, I call it clown and pound almost, because <laughs> I'm really playful with it, you okay. know, I don't. I don't well, we're going to talk about like the playfulness too, Mark, as you do a bunch of crazy stuff in that regard, but clown and pound, that's dope, dude. I gotta make yeah, a T-shirt like, for I don't that. Just jack <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I might and steal I that for the tagline for my website: Trash Talk MMA. Nope, nope. Come and get clown and pounded. It's dope. <laughs> yeah, I I just can't sit there like pistons and, and punch. Like I've got to have some movement and some deception and some hand fighting and and whatnot. And and the fact is, I'm not really afraid to mix it up on the feet. I just won't do it like a drunken zombie. You know, like yeah. I'll move off angles. I'll come back and I'll throw mine. You're going to throw yours. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to stand there and headbutt everything. And yeah, because we've never really seen you duck a firefight. Like, you'll go in mm -hmm. there, but you do it intelligently. It's, you know, technical firefighting. Yeah, like like John Howard's corner man would say. Like, I'll bitch ball while you throw your punches, and then I'll fire back when I think you're done. Yeah. Okay, so staying, uh, staying on Juban, uh, I mean, it's funny. He's you're 34. Is that correct? Yeah, 30, yeah. 34 years old. He's 32. There's only so there's only actually two years of difference between you two. But you have four times his fights. Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say that coming into this fight, we're definitely dealing with one of those experienced veterans versus versus young buck uh, type dynamics. Again, I'm sure for you, uh, 70 fights deep, this is this is nothing new. But. Uh, what what do you what do you make of these types of matchups? I mean, ultimately, if and maybe the better question here is, what do you stand to gain by beating Juban? He stands to gain a ton from beating you. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like as far as a title run, when I when I jumped back in on short notice and fought at UFC 149, and I lost a a bit of a contentious split decision to James Head, like. I felt I ruined my own title run. Yeah. And then it took me a year and a half to get back in the, the cage because of an injury. And um, I still went in injured because I re-aggravated it bloody 12 days before the fight uh, to go in against Rick Story, which was already the toughest fight of my career, really. You know, Rick Story and Hector Lombard both being yep. southpaw, power-punching, judo, wrestling, yeah, hard-nosed dudes. Like, yep. Those are two of the, the toughest you know, tasks I've ever been given. And so to come in rusty uh, after such a long layoff and whatnot, um, and then to lose that decision, obviously, like as far as a title run, like I'm sitting at the back of the line again, you know? Yeah. So right now I'm, I'm fighting for respect and a payday and, and, and uh, 
you know, kind of like what we talked about, not going in there trying to run through a brick wall. I want to come out of this fight healthy. I want to go out and put on a beautiful performance where, yeah. you know, I don't take damage. I can get off my own offense um, and, and I can get my job done. So do you feel, based on the, the longer term objective here of judging from what you're saying, you want to make a title run. Uh, it sounds like that's either you, you're in the UFC for this reason. So does Juban, uh, does a dominant victory over Juban put you in the place where you want to be to ask for what, perhaps a, a top 15 guy, maybe, or even a top oh, five yeah, to I 10 mean, guy? I think, I think I can ask for a top 15 guy anytime I want one. Okay. Again, we talked about the UFC being nice enough to let me fight when I want, yep. um, and, and possibly even where I want, as long as you know the location's not a drama and cool. It's not like I'm bumping people off cards, but you know, as long as I put in my request, they seem to treat me like a bit of a veteran. Yeah, um, I'm pretty certain if I asked for a top guy uh, after beating Joe Bon, if that's the case, I, I could get one. Yeah. Okay. As long as I don't go out there and stink up the show and, and put on a really boring fight. So, I mean, you had 60 fights and fought for 11 years before getting to the UFC. When did you, in that buildup of your career, when did you feel like, okay, the time is now? Like, how come I'm not getting the call? At what point were you like, this needs to happen? Or did it even need to happen? Was getting to the UFC always the ultimate goal? Well, it's definitely always the ultimate goal because that's where the best guys are. That's where you can actually get paid. That's when I could actually make a small living doing this. I mean, I, I started my contract. My first one for Chris Lida was 6000 and 6000 You know, by no means was that a veteran contract, you know. You get Hector Lombard coming in at, you know, a reported six-figure to show up, like, off of a Bellator, uh, a series of Bellator wins that, my God, anyone could have won those fights. Anyone yep. in the UFC would have won those fights. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a little frustrating, you know, seeing a guy that you went four good rounds with and then the pay scale is massively different. But yeah, like that was always the goal. Uh, it was always a goal to make this a, a real living instead of having to coach and work in bars and, and do other stuff to make a living. Um, you know, now I coach because I want to, not because I have to. Yeah. So a little bit helpful. And, uh, yeah, there was, there was a time when, you know, I thought I was going to get on the ultimate fighter. They told me that I had to come to Vegas. I couldn't come to Vegas cause I had a, a fight in Australia that same weekend. Funny enough, that was my cartwheel kick knockout. The <laughs> ones where I actually really, really landed it hard on someone. Yeah. Uh, so I watched it ad nausea but, yesterday. Hilarious. Yeah. So, I mean, I could have been on the ultimate fighter seven, apparently if I'd have gave some good interviews while I was in Vegas. The skill set thing was never the issue, and they even told me that. I just needed to be there to deal with the, the production people. I'm like, well, can't we do it over Skype? Can't you watch videos I've done in the past? Like, you know I can talk. You know that, you know. Look I've what we're doing right now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. This is over why Skype. Do I, why do I need to fly to Vegas? You're not paying for the flight either, are you? Nope. No, no, we won't pay for that. Yeah. Well, what? You, you guys are joking. Yep. You know, I'm supposed to buy a lottery ticket flight to Vegas, pass up a fight, ruin a connection here, all because you want to interview me, which we can do with technology. I, I, yep. It blew my mind. So well, I got what, a little bit yeah. sick of the whole ultimate fighter path, to be honest. Yep. And, and they didn't want me on UFC 110 because I was an American with 13 losses. Um, Weird. Mind you, most of them were home, hometown split decisions and, and to pretty talented guys nonetheless. And, uh, yeah, I just didn't think I was getting in. UFC 127, I emailed them six months before. They told me the card was full. Six months before, before the show, the card's full. Yeah. Okay. With, 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 and it probably so got changed 50% said, over the time with all the injuries and the scandals and the PED usage and the, the home invasions. And the, <laughs> yeah, know, so we basically the wife said, beating. Well, hey, I'm going to be here. If someone gets injured, call me. And then... My manager called me. I was riding. Uh, I was riding a scooter, which is a big thing in Thailand, not so big in Australia. Or but I was riding yeah. Benny Alloway's scooter, an Ultimate Fighter kid. I was training with him for an upcoming fight that we both had on the same show. Okay. And uh, I got the call from what became my manager, uh, a pretty good friend of mine. He got the email from Joe Silva, and uh, asking me if I was ready to go. That there was an injury. So tears in my eyes on a scooter. 
not you know really thinking this was real, wondering where the you know where the joke was coming in. And then once I realized it was real, my big concern was, please don't let it be John Fitch that got hurt, and please don't let it be B.J. Penn that got hurt because I don't want to fight John Fitch. Yeah, I know you guys. You, know, uh, you guys trained in the past, exactly. Yeah, so that was where my head went, and then. Lucky enough for me, it was Carlos Condit that got hurt. Chris Lido was probably a better matchup for me than Condit, um, just because of the wrestling jujitsu angle. You know, yep. the striking is always tough with just about anyone, but I thought I had a, a wrestling advantage over Chris and, and went out and, and tried to make that the game plan. And um, yeah, finally got in. So there was that little bit of validation, like a lot of years doing it, and I finally made it worthwhile. But again, it was kind of on luck. Yeah. You know, so even now I'm still fighting for respect in a way because, you know, I, I don't feel like they called me because they thought I was one of the best in the world. They, they called somebody. me because yep. someone. Now, listen, I want to I want to stay on that topic because uh, Chris Lytle is actually one of my favorite fighters. And uh, you you fought him when he was on a five fight tear. That's when Chris Lytle had really basically come into it, come on to himself, I believe. I mean, he may have a different opinion on it, but I think once he lost to Matt Sarah on the Ultimate Fighter finale, which led to Sarah getting the title fight and winning the belt against GSP. And then crazy. But Lytle after that made it, uh, you know, he he cleared what appeared to be a, a real mental blockage. And he's like, <coughs> I'm going all out every fight. I'm going for broke, kill or be killed. And to me, he turned into one of the, 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 the greatest, uh, I guess, greatest non- number one contender type fighters in the welterweight division after that loss to Matt Serra and just went on a series of destruction. And you were on his path when he did that. Um, yeah. This was, so you're against Lytle when he's tearing a new asshole on everybody and it's your UFC debut. Octagon jitters? Like, what was that experience for you to finally get there? You're going in against a guy who's on a blitzkrieg of a tear and it's your UFC debut. I think I was just too overwhelmed with actually being there, finally, to even worry about him because I was confident with the matchup anyway. Um, just the way he boxes, I was pretty confident that I could range him and keep range and break range. Yeah. Uh, and he throws a lot of hooks. I'm okay with that. Okay. You know, so I, I felt pretty comfortable. And as long as I got my double leg off, I felt I was going to get a takedown or two and be able to do some work. Didn't think it was going to go quite as spectacularly as it did. And to be fair, if I didn't land that knee in the second round, would it have been the most amazing fight of the night? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I thought the first round was entertaining, and I thought the third round was uh, a pretty good scrap. Um, but I think that knockdown, taking the whole breath out of the arena collectively at once, yeah, uh, I think that's made the, the biggest story. And, and that's what actually And you got fight of the night. Have, you got fight of the night for that fight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's that obviously everything. that's the Chris Lytle signature, right? I mean, he just yeah. fight of the night award after one after the other after the other. So that's good. Yeah. So I mean, it sounds yeah, that, like you it sounds like you fought for a pittance fight. on the fight, but you made a nice little paycheck at the end of the day because you were involved in, in the best scrap of the night. Yeah, that changed everything. That let me pay my coaches properly, that let me uh that let me pay off my student loan that let me buy a, a, a cheap used car just to have something in the US um, yeah that changed everything if it wasn't for that I financially still would have been a big struggle and would have been a bit bothered probably about the whole yeah. UFC pay thing you know I'd be sitting on the other side of the fence as it stands can the fighters make more money in the UFC it, it if we were treated like real pro athletes um, but in the end, we're still the, it's the best game there is out there, and yep. you know I don't see Bella treating anyone but Rampage all that good. You see the details of Rampage's contract? Yeah, dude. With Crazy. Bellator? Crazy. Oh, that's, that's my interesting biggest one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar Tesla is a signing bonus. Yep. And who he, gets a hundred twenty-five thousand dollar car as a signing bonus? And now he's out of there, <laughs> and he's back in the UFC at one eighty-six. I think he's at the next pay per view. Oh. He he's he just blows up bridges. Yep. And then other people build the bridge back to him for him. Controversial character, man. Now lucky man. I mean, but you know, it's the power of marketing. You know, it's the power of the brand, the rampage brand. It's it's a powerful brand. We can say what we want about the guy as a fighter, 
And listen, I'm a Rampage fan, but I mean, I've, I've, I've just haven't been interested in seeing him compete probably since the John Jones fight. Even I, I thought the, Ram, yeah. the, the Rashad fight was a letdown. The Machida yeah. fight was a letdown. The John Jones fight was a letdown. Not that we were expecting him to win that anyways. He's, yeah. got, he's, he's had three nice wins outside of the UFC in Bellator. But again, you know, Joey Beltran's and then Chris Mbupu's in, of this world are, are not going to, you know, allow him to jump back into the into the rankings of the... I mean, he's fighting Maldonado next. That's going to be a fight. I mean, because Maldonado's going to bring it, you know. Oh, he's going to swing. Yeah, it's going to be entertaining. And we talk about we talk about loaf of breadheads. I mean, Maldonado, he can take a shot, you know. It doesn't seem that doesn't seem, I mean, oh, okay, Stipe Miocic put him down real fast, but again, he was, you know, took a fight on short notice against a, a surging heavyweight who hits like a, yeah. a brick shit house like Arlovsky yeah, back in the day. So no 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 disrespect to Maldonado there. Most of us would go down, but one last thing back to Chris Lytle. Yeah. I I love how he's chosen how to retire and when to retire. I'm not saying that you're anywhere near that phase, but I mean, 70 fights deep, uh, I'm sure yeah, it just makes sense that that's, that's something that's crossed your mind. I, I, love, I love what Lytle did. He, he, he researched his career, went on, had a great, got a ton of great paydays with all these fight of the nights, submission of the nights, knockout of the nights in the UFC. Uh, beat the brakes off Dan Hardy in his last fight, who I really like as well. And, um, and, and called it a day. And, uh, to me, he pretty much laid out the blueprint of how to leave your mark, maybe not get the belt, but go out graciously and, and winning. What, what do you think of how Lytle, how Lytle ran his, uh, his retirement exit process there? Well, I love that he came back and, and, and took a pretty tough fight with, uh, with Dan Hardy and, and got the win and, and, and let it be, you know. Um, that was a fight he could have lost the decision on, too, if he didn't finish it. So... You know, to see him get a finish and, and do his thing. Um, but I guess the biggest thing that impresses me is he, he found a cause. You know, he didn't just go out and take another job. Like, he, he's trying to change his community and his area for the better. And um, that's, that's uber commendable. Yeah. So after you beat Chris Lytle, uh, you had another remarkable fight where some really funny things happened against uh, Dennis Hallman. So he came into the fight uh, basically wearing speedos, and pretty much everybody was was outraged with uh, it just just this just it just felt wrong, man. That come on, we're no longer it's no longer the uh, you know UFC one and two where you had these wrestlers coming in with the the, the tidy the tidy whiteies or the tidy undies on, and uh, you beat the brakes off Dennis Hallman. And uh, rumor has it that literally Dana White gave you a, a bonus just for whooping his ass for coming in there dressed uh, so foolishly. Is that true? Yeah, there was a couple <laughs> of knockouts that night, and yeah. uh, I was sitting next to Vitor Belfort at the press conference, Okay. and they announced knockout of the night, and it went to Vitor, and, and my heart sunk that little bit. You know, I was like, oh, Vitor's made so much money. Come on. Daddy needs a payday kind of thing. Yeah. And then he went into his little funny spiel about, this doesn't happen very often. This is very odd. This is what, and I started to get a little bit excited inside. You know, there was no submission on the yep. entire card. Okay. So that submission of the night bonus was there waiting, and I had, I guess, the most compelling, funny, interesting, unique fight story of the night. So um, yeah, I got another bonus. So my first two fights uh, gave me bonuses, and again, that's that's part of the reason why I don't really bitch about the UFC pay scale, like. A little offended that I got offered the the minimum six and six as a sixty some fight veteran coming in with some really tough wins and some really tough losses even. Yep. Um, and and again not getting beat up in any of my losses really. Hector Lombard is about the guy that beat me up the most, um, but that wasn't a TKO or or a submission or whatnot. So um, yeah, it was just one of them things where that helped me kind of bridge that gap mentally and and not not be down on the whole situation, you know, cause really coming in and beating two of the best guys in the world, then looking at your next payday and just going, really? Yeah. I don't, I don't get a raise even for that. I just beat two guys that have beat champions and I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling to pay for my fight camp. Well, God you bless know? you so, dude, because I'm glad you got paid but, and, uh, I'm glad you got paid 
and I'm glad Speedos are banned from the UFC. Like, Speedos have literally now been banned from the UFC, so Juban better not think of, uh, of trying to bring those in to, uh, to sway the ladies uh, the, the, night, the night of your fight either, and he won't be allowed in. It'll distract him more than me, because I, I promise you I'll be pulling him up, pulling him down, pulling him sideways. Submission by gauge pull. I'll just walk up and be like, come on, show everybody, show everybody, show everybody, and I'll just start clinching his shorts, let alone Submission by, by wedgie. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have a good laugh. I'll make him uncomfortable. I'll take his back, make him uncomfortable. So I know the Rick but, uh, story the Rick story fight for you was um that was a contentious fight. What what happened there? Uh, you know, I know John Priest was helping you rehabilitate here in Thailand for your previous fight against Howard and that yeah. he he had a lot to say uh, about your condition going into the Rick story fight. You know, we're not trying to talk about excuses, but let's just talk facts. Were you injured going into that no, fight? Were you injured during that fight? What happened? Physically, I, I wasn't. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I couldn't level change. I couldn't put my knees on the mat. I couldn't do certain things. You know, um, you see me level change a couple of times and, and play around with the single leg just just to to be honest with the fact that I knew I needed to change at least the game left, right, high, low, in and out. Um, but I couldn't. I couldn't change levels like I wanted to and, and wrestle and play. And I was in there basically trying not to get the, the socks beat off me. And I tried to, to win as a boxer. Yeah. You know, I couldn't move well. I, I couldn't really play. So I, I felt like a sitting duck, you know, from the first, first round onward. And um, just wasn't fun. Just wasn't a fun fight. So I survived it, I guess. I, I, I did what in my mind I told myself at, at very minimum that's what I need to do. And... Um, yeah, I did that, and thankfully, after even a second loss, again, two pretty tough losses, um, but they gave me another fight, and I was able to come back and redeem myself and fight John Howard 90% healthy. You know, like I was I was pretty happy going into the John Howard fight. Uh, John Priest out at Tiger Muay Thai did a great job giving me like a, a warm-up routine and, and putting me through my paces on SNC in the time that I was with him, which – you know, it was pretty much right up until the fight. So, um, what exactly yeah, carrying, was your what was your ailment? I mean, what what was your condition that you were dealing with? Was it? A, a I tore my lower I tore my lower back up really bad. Okay. Early, like, yeah. After my first UFC fight, I, I haven't been the same. How um, are you feeling now? Since, uh, average, to be fair, <laughs> average. Average. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm Is not that... shooting. I'm not wrestling in my fight camp like I used to wrestle. You know, I'm not putting in the repetitions I used to. Um, so I, I don't do the college wrestling drilling and, and grinding that I used to do because I can't physically handle it. I won't do it the next day. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be, uh, that's gotta be deflating because I mean, even a guy like John Howard, I mean, you do not want to be going in there <laughs> with, with your tool set broken in half. Uh, you know, and it seems yeah. like, you know, you, your mobility, your flexibility, that's a huge, huge component of your of your stellar grappling game. Yeah, I mean, it, it affects everything. Like, you know, not being able to lift your foot off the mat without getting a twinge of pain firing up your your lower back. You know, that, that that's terrible. To to lift your leg and try to throw a kick is almost out of the question. Now, I mean, going back to even like that Dennis Holman incident, you know, where he uh, he showed up looking uh looking all silly. Uh, one of the things that's kind of refreshing about you too is that you, you you seem to come in there with a sense of humor. You know, a lot of fighters are going in there, mean mugging the camera, acting tough at the weigh-ins, fists up in people's faces, nose to nose, forehead to forehead. That whole like supercharged testosterone, I'm an alpha male shit. That doesn't seem to that doesn't seem to be part of your mo. Where 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 does your, where does your sense of humor fit into your whole fighting style? I wrestled my entire life and I ran across that many guys that were hard asses that you can't out hard ass them. Like it doesn't do anything like to laugh at a guy being a hard ass is actually a better way to get in their head and to bother them. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, it just never suited me to try to beat them at what they were good at. I just figured I would be me and if it makes me laugh or makes me giggle, even if it makes me a little bit shy, well, okay, I'll yeah. be shy. You, you come at, come at me. You know, yeah, I've wrestled some really strong dudes that come out and just 
try to run through you and they might get a lead you know they might get two takedowns and they're up four to two fantastic and then we get on the mat in the second period and i ride them for two minutes and and frustrate them and then yeah we're back on even par and then the third round's just who's wily enough to go score now you know so I, i've been through that battle and that that roundabout kind of psychological situation that many times just comfortable with me and me now you you do what you do and i'll see you on the day yeah and what, I, what i like about you with that though is you're congruent with it you know i've had the pleasure of actually you know spending some time with you in person out in thailand uh, we went down to the uh the full metal dojo one event that you were uh you were refing yep. and um you know firsthand i can experience how, how genuine your 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 cavalier and your, your, your you know you've got a sense of humor and how how congruent that attitude is from you across the board and it's it's great to see that you don't have this disconnected brian ebersole ebersole the man versus brian ebersole the fighter you know you're brian ebersole 100 percent of the time and uh it's a really it's a really different look from a lot of of guys who are involved as fighters in mma yeah i can't i can't put on the the chill zone and conor mcgregor camera thing yeah just but they do it well listen I, and, and, I, and i like what they do too I'm just saying that with, yeah, it's I, nice because you've carved your own your own persona, and it's not a persona. It's actually who you are. Yeah, I, I just can't. I don't know. I just can't do it. Yeah. I mean, if someone told me it was my job and, and gave me a task, I, I can put on a character and be playful, but I usually reserve that for my friends. Put on a certain voice that gives them like a mental image, and then I'll try to play that voice. You know, Whether it's a cartoon character, like I'll Homer Simpson someone for five minutes, and just see what comes out of them and have a laugh. But yeah, I can't, I can't really do that with the interviews and for the camera and, and really getting personal with another athlete. I almost find that difficult unless there's something about that athlete. I, I don't like, and I know I don't like it cause I've seen it in person. So most of these guys I've never met. You know, I, I don't know these guys. The only thing I had on Dennis Hallman was he beat my wrestling coach. I'm going to come out and beat him. Fantastic, you know. <laughs> okay, most now, of these other guys I yeah. haven't known them. Yeah, know nothing about them. Now, one of the one of the funny things too, before I do interviews, is you know, is just looking into people's sort of their past. And and I know you haven't done sixty fights before getting to the UFC. You obviously had to work some other jobs and stuff. And I and I see that when you dropped out of college, you actually worked on a pig farm. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> what was that all about? Yeah. Uh, it was the only full-time job I could find in the area, and it was like 40 minutes away. Um, I just couldn't afford to live where I was living. And the the, the embarrassing part is, is I'm like I'm really good at math. You're really like, good at math. Conceptually, now I'm still conceptually really good at math. Like you'll say something, and I'll do the math in my head and spit an answer back out, like on the exact uh, within like a minute. When I was young, I was really good at the formal math because I paid attention in school, and I've I've forgotten algebra. I have no idea how to do half this shit anymore. My yeah. cousins are oh, in dude. high school, and I can't help them with their math. I can't do simple. But long story additions. short, I, I don't I don't know how I didn't budget properly. I I don't know. Maybe because I was just young and dumb, and I thought as long as I do what everyone else is doing, it's working for them. It'll work for me. I figured I work in the summer, I go to school, things should work out. Well, it wasn't yeah. working out, and I was broke and, and couldn't pay my rent, and Dad had to come down and pay my rent, and as soon as Dad paid my rent, I dropped out of school and went and got a job. I didn't even ask my dad, didn't tell him, just went, screw yeah. classes, I got to be a man, take care of my you know my own responsibilities, and I've chosen this lifestyle, which is to live down here and drink on weekends and do what I do, and well, I better go make the money to do it. So dropped out, got that job. Uh, worked there for a little while in, in besides like the weird part of working like 12 hour days, doing something that you don't like to do. I was doing something that I knew wasn't after a while. I knew it wasn't right. Like it was a factory farm. It's all yeah. that stuff that Americans are now starting to realize their food comes from. Yeah. And uh, the, the, yeah, the people that, want to pay attention to it or heartbroken by it and the other people that don't want to pay attention do the whole well why do you post it on facebook and why don't you go do something well because people like you still buy the fucking bacon yep every day at the grocery store it does it, 
I can't do anything if you keep buying the product. You know what I mean? You know, it's really funny you say that because people always like to complain, you know, whether religion, politics, marketing, oversaturation, commercialism, uh, commercial purchases, etc. And what they don't understand is it comes down to a really simple thing nowadays is you vote with the way you spend your money. Plain and simple. Yep. That's how we all vote now. It's not at the ballots. It's how you choose to spend your money. And if you disagree with something, then you just the best the best statement you can make is to just stop purchasing and consuming it, right? Yep. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, just seeing the just seeing like the the three thousand animals, just the way they're treated and, and the, the illnesses they get and the way it it, ha- it was terrible. And I mean this was, was back terrible. when. What what year would this have been? Two thousand and one, two thousand and two. Yeah, so the bad practices were already in place there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nine eleven. I was working this job right around nine eleven. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So the reason the pig farm thing caught my eye though is because I'm from Vancouver, Canada. And I don't know if have you ever heard of a serial killer named uh, Robert Picton? Mm-mm. Have so not. this is a crazy just off tangent story where Robert Picton they'll make a movie about him because it's some it's some Hannibal <laughs> it's like, some Hannibal Lecter shit, dude. Like this guy, he had a pig farm outside of uh, outside of Vancouver, Canada, and he was a sick bastard who would. There's an area in Vancouver called uh, like the what's it called uh, East Hastings, and it's it's funny because okay. Vancouver is a posh city now, and there's a very posh neighborhood called Yale Town, and it's adjacent to what is probably considered the four to six blocks of the most grimiest crack fiends patrolling the streets. Like you go on the street so and guys are it's just like Jersey. It's basically just this this shithole of a drug segment of Vancouver where you've just got crack whores and crackheads and heroin junkies and and it's right what's crazy, it's 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 adjacent to all these lucrative, expensive cities in the city. And it was a real problem when they brought the Olympics to Vancouver back in uh what was that, 2010, they had the Winter Olympics? Because they basically had okay. to like, shuffle these guys out of Vancouver because they're like, we can't have people you know, coming from all around the world and then seeing that we've just basically got this this New Jack City-style crack neighborhood <laughs> right right in the middle of downtown Vancouver. Anyway, this Picton pig farmer dude, he would roll through this area at night with a van and basically round up crack whores, throw them in his van, take them back to his pig farm, drug them, get them drunk, kill them in the most brutal fashion, do the most horrifying things to their corpses, and he ended up burying them in, the, uh, in his pig farm, like in the soil, in the ground. But he was actually then feeding remains of these, these women to his pigs oh, yeah. and selling the pigs. I'm telling you, it's something out of a movie. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I saw Pig yeah. Farm and I thought, hey, I it's wonder like if ever snatch, someone's ever heard of uh, yeah, Robert Picton. It's like Snatch. When they say they'll take you out to the pig farm and you'll disappear. Absolutely, like that's so it's for real. Like and even in the movie Hannibal, you know, they are you, are you a Silence of the Lambs fan at all? Oh yeah, I've yeah. seen it. You know, oh if you haven't watched, have you been watching the Hannibal TV show? No, I don't know, I don't know if you're big into TV watched. series. Good. Throw it on your iPod. If you like the Silence of the Lambs, you loved Hannibal. They've done a basically a prequel series to uh, to the Silence of the Lambs trilogy, and they're it's cool because they're really using a lot of the elements of the existing mythology that's been established in the movies, but they're also reinterpreting a lot of things. And you have Hannibal okay. being played by Mads Mikkelsen. I don't know if you know Mads Mikkelsen. He played uh, the villain in uh, Casino Royale. He's a really, gotcha. really dodgy looking, uh, where's he from? I forget, but look up Mads Mikkelsen, Hannibal, throw that stuff on your iPad for when you're traveling. I guarantee you, if you like right. the Hannibal movies, you'll love the, um, you'll love the TV show. It's very, the production values are through the roof, great acting, and just a great use of the mythology and Mads Mikkelsen, in my opinion, he's just smoked Anthony Hopkins as <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. Like he was yeah. put on earth Maybe to do this. I'm sorry. Maybe it's something to watch during fight week. Oh, yeah, ramp yeah. up to. Oh yeah, you'll you'll ramp you, up. You, <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting demented, show. That sick, twisted, demented mindset. Yeah, but what's great about Hannibal, though, and I think it just makes him the greatest villain ever, is that there's first of all, he's got crazy martial arts skills, and you see him fight a ton in the show. 
and he's a he's a mean ass cook. I don't know if you like to eat, but he's a, you see him <laughs> cooking a lot in the show. You just you just got to watch it and give it give it at least three or four episodes. It takes a little while to get the the gears going in the show, and even the first season into itself is good. The second season is great. The third one starts in June, and honestly, I've never anticipated a show more than a than season the, the season three debut of uh, of Hannibal. Gotcha, gotcha. I, know, I guess we got on this because you worked on a pig farm. There you go. Talk about going <laughs> off tangent, right? Yeah. Excellent. Well, listen, Brian, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, what, what's next for you? What, uh, what, can, what can fans expect from you in the weeks and the months leading up to your fight? Probably not a whole lot. You're just going to be going the grind, right? Maybe just some, some social commentary and, and, and maybe throwing out a few uh, investment properties over Facebook and Twitter and a few things like that. That's um, something we didn't those, cover. Uh, we didn't cover that. Yeah, I those, wanted to talk about that Those couple you. fight bonuses I got got me into the real estate game, and I bought some rental properties in my hometown, and I was approached by a sponsor at one point, um, and what he does is he goes and buys a lot of houses that have fallen through the foreclosure yep. situation. So uh, he gets houses pretty cheap off off of banks, and he snipes you know the ones that he knows uh, will hold some value, and that he doesn't have to do major renovations to. So he's just teaching me how to be smart with money, you know, and he's teaching me that you you make money when you buy, not when you sell. You oh, know? That so is, instead uh, that's of the rule of thumb uh, in real estate investment, exactly, and a lot of people yeah. just don't think like that. That you 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 yeah. make the money at the moment you buy it, not when you sell it. Yeah, you don't want to buy a house and pay the mortgage for 25 years. And then when you want to move, you're so emotionally invested in that home that you're not going to take a penny less than whatever. You know, you set this retail price and, and no one's getting your house unless they're willing to pay that. Um, so if you can go make good buys, you can be very generous to people, you know. Yeah. And uh, there's a situation in America now because the banks don't have – the capacity to hold a foreclosed home and make it work for them. Yeah, they need to get rid of them. So, yeah, he uh, he knows how to play the game, and he's he teach me. And long story short, I'm I'm trying to pass on some of his deals to other people because I know they work. Yeah, you know, I'm at the point where I need I need another fight or fight of the night bonus before I buy another house. So yeah, it's you know, uh, the only way I'm gonna. It's an interesting topic. I, uh, I actually attended a seminar in London a few months ago about the, you know, the, the benefits of and, and the ease of investing into real estate and making money in, in the United States, like specifically in the United yeah. States, because of the way things have changed with the, you know, with the economic crisis and how, how, how the cost of homes is going back up. But more importantly, I'm, I'm glad we touch on this subject. Uh, I actually had James McSweeney on my podcast yesterday and, and Travis Luter as well, and we were talking about you know, post fight career revenue streams for fighters and how, yeah. and it, how it's so important for them to intelligently manage some of this money they make while they're fighting and that they begin to think of it now of, you know, the shelf life of a fighter is small, is short. You know, there's just no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, and I'm sure you can attest to that, even though you've had a, you've had an Absolutely. exceptionally long career and Yours is particularly long because, as we talked about at the very beginning, you you know you're, you've avoided taking a ton of damage to your head, and you know it's like you, you got all your marbles, and obviously you're still using your marbles because you're investing your money intelligently and finding ways to make money in your sleep. You know people have to realize that real estate is a fantastic form of passive income, and if you don't know what passive income, that's making money in your sleep. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically took my fight, my second fight bonus, and put it in real estate, and um, while my money, I haven't made it back yet. But that's going to be just that hopefully lifetime paycheck. Yeah, you know, and it's the cash a couple flow. hundred bucks a yes. month, rest exactly. of my life. Yeah, it should work out. Excellent. So, um, yeah, trying to trying to teach other people how to do the same thing with uh, with much less than you would need to buy a house in England or or especially Australia. You know, the average house in Australia is a half million dollar home, where the U.S. it's a hundred thousand. Well, that's what so, was funny because yeah. I actually I actually attended this this business course in London and you know they were trying to sell this concept to Europeans to because yeah. there's even a possibility of doing this remotely so even if if you've got some dough and you want to invest it you can do it in the United States even remotely i mean it, it involves you know having a Absolutely. team on site etc and getting people to manage the properties for you but it's not impossible and it's a it's oh. a good way to it's a good way to to, to make some long term dough 
and to get some short-term yeah. or, or immediate cash uh, cash flow going as well. Yeah, certainly. Two hundred and fifty dollars for an hour of a lawyer's time, and um, you'll have the right documents drawn up that that see you legally. You know, uh, whether you even own the home, the deed might not even need to be in your name, but you'll have a, yeah. uh, the beneficial interest of the the cash flow that comes from it. So, so there's, if people there's are if people listening to this are actually interested in in knowing more about this, are you open to them contacting you about this? Absolutely. Brian at fight.tv. Doesn't get much easier than that one. Okay. Now, I know you're pretty active yeah, on social media too. Like uh, I've seen that, you know, you're and you and you're posting some intelligent stuff. What what's social media done for you and how do you like to be active on there and how do you how do you like to cultivate your your brand via social media? It's, uh, I I don't follow uh too many random sites like the things i follow like the mind unleashed and upworthy um and things like that films for action i want the truth i don't want fiction i don't want memes i you know I, as, as much as i'll see a meme or two but um i i don't want that stuff i don't want to be clogged up with with the trivial so the pollution uh, i don't know time like i share stuff without ever actually watching the video sometimes only so i can go back and watch the video later or to start a conversation so i get the crux of the main point from other people telling me yeah and then i can just have a conversation and learn about the video and i save myself two hours yeah you know so i try to put up stuff that has to do with nature the environment uh corporatocracy politics um it's just my ongoing education that I, I could yeah. go and look on websites, but to be fair, I like the um, I like the fact that it's almost like a classroom environment that I've created on my page in the sense that I'll put something out for students to comment and and you know lead a conversation or follow a conversation, whatever the case may be. So yeah, I I have a more of a thirst for learning now than I did when I was in school. Yeah, you that's know. another. That's just another philosophy that I've really been embracing since I, I quit my career a year and a half ago, and I've just been traveling and, and you know meeting so many new people, reading a ton, attending a ton of seminars, uh, just opening my mind to another to a, to a different world. And uh, it's that it's that necessity to keep learning, man. You just you just gotta keep learning. If you're not learning, you're not growing, and if you're not growing, you're dying. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to learn what you're good at and what you want to do. Yeah. But if you don't know the the inner workings or or what gears turn other industries, yeah. How can you ever be like balanced and how can you ever judge or or make an opinion on other things, you know? So just trying to learn about how everything else works, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So which uh where can people find you on social media? Where are you the most active? Where do you like to interact the most? And how can we uh, how can uh, fans get a hold of you? Honestly, yeah, Facebook's the one for me. Just Brian Ebersole. I have a, a fan page on Facebook. Yep. Um, you can send messages to me the same way you can on a personal page. Um, yeah, which so often you don't have to a do lot of people don't request. allow. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to do a friend request. You can post things on my page like just like it's a wall. Yep. So it really does work just like a, a personal page. And, um, yeah, it helps me stay connected. I mean, I got a fair few people on there, and I get some pretty neat stuff. Uh, that comes through and, and some really good conversations every now and again. Awesome. Well, listen, Brian, I could talk with you for hours. I think I say that to almost every one of you guys. I mean, there's, there's really, uh, it's just it's just fascinating getting to, to meet and talk with uh, professional fighters on a personal level and to dig uh, deeper than what we get to see in a, a countdown to UFC number, number, number episode or a, a post-fight interview or a you know, press conference. So, uh, I hope this is one in a series of many. I think you've got a great, uh, a great perspective on life and on fighting. Um, you're very cerebral, and it's nice to know that uh, you're, you're interested in more than just your career, and that uh, you're, you're very diversified while, while remaining focused. Yeah, in the end, you got to be a human being at some stage, and I yeah. figure uh, the closer I come to retirement, the the more I should probably start practicing being a, a, a balanced human being. Yeah, no doubt. I'm uh, I'm I'm trying to achieve that status, and it's it's not easy, man. It's incredible how powerful the comfort zone is, and how difficult it is to step outside of it. But how that's the only way to keep moving forward and to progress is to step outside that comfort zone. Yeah, yeah it's going to be an interesting day when the next fight's not the next fight and not the next thing. That's for sure. So yeah, I, yeah I'm like sure for a fighter, that's zone. just always what's next, and you're always like. 
the next fight and eventually that that comes to a conclusion but it sounds like you're intelligently preparing yourself for that day that's the plan i appreciate your time man thank hey, you so much excellent Antoine. we'll uh we'll, we'll do it again uh, this is uh it's great to be able to do this over skype and uh yeah like i said you know you were talking about it earlier how people wanted to fly you across the world to interview you it's like no just plug in a headset turn this thing on and uh let's chat you know those things are uh that's technology. That's that's obsolete. This is this is the present. This is the future. Yeah, yeah. Big carbon footprint just to go for an interview in Vegas. All right. <laughs> Excellent, Brian. This yeah. was the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host Antoine Peltier with my guest UFC welterweight contender Brian Bad Boy Ebersol. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on uh, Facebook. Make sure you do the same with Brian. Send him some cool stuff uh, his way. Let's keep this world and this dialogue interesting. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast.